So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the first Friday lunch of the semester uh, with Professor Shafi Goldwasser. Shafi is also one of the faculty co-directors of FinTech at CSAIL. She will speak today about current efficient homomorphic encryption verification methods, which can maintain privacy of digital documents and contracts while verifying compliance and validity. Um, you're, please feel free to share questions for, Sh for Shafi in the chat, and I'll ask them on your behalf throughout the presentation. Um, and with that, please, Shafi, take it away. Thank you very much, um, <clears throat> Matt. I will share my screen. Thank everyone for coming in. Just a second. Yeah, so actually, um, I'm not going to talk about fully homo verification or fully homomorphic encryption, but I'm, I am going to talk about verification uh, more on the zero knowledge side. Um, sort of, uh, I'm going to point out to all kinds of um, verification dilemmas that come up in the law and how zero knowledge can uh, help to address them. And this is joint work with uh, Ron Canetti and who's in Boston University, Kenneth Bamberger and Rebecca Wexler from the law school actually at Berkeley and Evan Zimmerman who used to be in the law school. Uh, this work is gonna appear in the Berkeley Technology Law Journal. If I have some time, I will also tell you about uh, Duality Technologies, which is a company that I'm a co-founder of, which does do fully homomorphic encryption and uh, secure analytics in the cloud. And uh, the two to topics are in some sense unrelated to each other, although they're all in the space of privacy enhancing technologies. And I really encourage you to ask questions. It's a bit hard to talk to a crowd, which I don't even see the faces. So I have no idea what your expressions are. Uh, so I'd love it if people ask questions, just pipe up. And uh, I think you can unmute yourselves automatically, I hope. If not, um, then send something in the chat. Okay, so just a, a, a brief uh, review, which I think most of the people here probably know, but just to put us in context, and uh, in some sense, this is um, ancient, ancient, ancient history from 1985, um, where uh, this idea of a zero knowledge proof came up. So I just wanna sort of review it very, very quickly. Uh, in the most naive terms, um, you have two parties, we call them, let's say, Alice and Bob, and let's say that Alice just wants to identify herself to Bob because she wants to um, convince him to send her some information or uh, to believe that her when she sends him information. So she says, I'm Alice. Maybe she wants to buy something from him. Let me buy. He says, well, prove that you're Alice. And then she sends him a password. That's kind of the canonical way that we think about it. And then what does Bob do? He compares Alice's password to whatever he knew before. So I'm really thinking about, um, uh, Bob is not an individual, it might be a company that Alice is a customer, and he kept Alice's password. Obviously, this is not a good method. You know, credit cards get stolen, passwords get stolen, they're hacks, email addresses, uh, it's continuous. And even in 1985, we understood that, uh, much worse now. So um, Bob or Amazon or whatever company cannot be trusted, not because they're a faulty, but, but because they can be broken to, they can be leaked from, and maybe even have malicious insiders. So we don't want to just send our password on the line. And we don't want Bob to just store our password in the clear because then somebody in Bob's organization would know it or somebody could um, log in there. So the question was, can actually Alice prove to Bob that she knows a password without providing it? And um, here's a first step. Um, it's not example three, it's just this example. Uh, and that is that let's take some hard computational problem where uh, Alice knows the answer and um, there's a problem. Only Alice knows how to solve it. And what's an example of such a problem? Let's say Alice has a number, a very large number N, and she knows, uh, let's think of N as 15, that's not very large, but N 15 is equal to three times five, Alice knows three times five. In fact, example 15 is stupid because everybody knows three times five but it could be a much 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 larger number a thousand digits and she knows two numbers that if you multiply you get that thousand digit number how does she know it maybe she chose those numbers to begin with and multiplied and that's what identifies alice her knowledge of those divisors so in order to identify her doesn't send a password she sends those two primes let's say two numbers three and five such that three times five is 15 except much larger numbers now bob can also multiply so now he knows that Alice knew P and Q. So he didn't have to store this P and Q. 
he could just verify this information that only not Alice was supposed to know. Of course, the problem here is that everybody that's watching the line can also see this. So uh, the question of zero knowledge was, can Alice actually convince Bob that she knows prime P and Q and he can verify and be convinced only if she does, but doesn't give P and Q away. And uh, so three and five, any question? This is probably ancient history to all of you, but okay. Um, and the only reason we think this is an interesting idea is because factoring on a classical computer is a hard problem, right? So 35 example, it's trivial. Maybe even a number like this is quick for most, for some people, but this is for long for some humans. And when you get to a thousand digits, it's really even the fastest computer would take a thousand years. Okay. Another thing that you might be thinking, wait a second, this whole thing is pointless because we're gonna have quantum computers and we shouldn't really trust that factoring is a hard problem. And in fact, in 1982, Richard Feynman at Caltech envisioned this idea of a quantum computer, which is still not something that we know how to do. And, um, but on paper it exists. And then in 1994, Peter Shores at MIT in the math department showed that if Feynman's computer was to be built, then you could factor numbers really quickly. So it's not a hard problem anymore. So Alice's password is not secure if we use that method. Assuming even if we knew how to prove that we know P and Q, uh, you know, three and five in a way that doesn't reveal them, maybe it's actually an easy problem. Well, we don't have to worry that much because quantum computers that exist today cannot do really better than uh, factoring a number, which is this size. So they really cannot go to a thousand digits. This thing has three digits. And uh, still, you know, we, um, as you know, there's a lot of claims uh, about quantum computers coming of age and many companies in many countries and governments are racing toward building a quantum computer. They're still not there. Uh, we have this famous cartoon that we always talk about that, um, that when you ask, how's your prototype doing? He says, well, the project exists in a simultaneous state of being both totally successful and not even started because there's this issue that you can, a quantum computer can be in many states at the same time. But uh, still in the NSA, the National Institute of Standards have started to plan for this idea of post-quantum cryptography, where you have problems, not just like factoring, which can be factored on a class, uh, broken on a classical computer, but you have problems that even a quantum, on a quantum computer, but you have problems that even a quantum computer cannot solve. And in, uh, in fact, we don't have to worry because already in 96, independent of quantum computing, um, Mikolaj Aitay from IBM Research showed an entirely new form of cryptography using sort of geometry in place of numbers and number theory. And that has morphed into um, a whole bunch of new cryptographic schemes which don't use factoring. They use a problem where com quantum computers don't know how to break it. And furthermore, they actually enable amazing things to do in cryptography, like homomorphic encryption, which I will touch on a little bit at the end of my talk. So um, instead of our password be, you know, these two primes, it, they could be some other uh, solution to a hard problem, not the factoring problem. In fact, there's a problem called learning with errors, and there will be a solution to that kind of a problem which is specified by a bunch of equations and secret variables. And there's some sort of, and uh, everybody knows these equations. They know these noisy answers. So it's not exact answers, but they have a little noise in them, but only Alice will know the solution to the equations. So the way that she proves to Bob that she's Alice, she gives him a solution to a set of equations. Back to zero knowledge. We still are in this situation. Alice says, I'm Alice. Bob says, prove it. And she says, I prove to you that I know how to solve a set of equation that identifies me. But how does she do it? Does she give him the set of the solutions? Can she just prove that she knows the solutions without giving them? That's what zero knowledge proofs do. So in 1985, we came up with this idea that proofs exist that reveal nothing except that they exist. So the, the claim is true. Alice does know a set of solutions to the equation or she knows P and Q and therefore it's Alice. And the way that it's done, it's not something that I'll tell you, but in some sense you can think about it is that there is a way to generate sort of challenges, difficult mathematical challenges, which are easy if you know the P and Q in the case of factoring or the solution to the equation in the case of learning with errors. 
So if you know the proof, but it will be essentially impossible if you don't. So if you, uh, in some sense, to check that Alice is Alice, Bob gives her a bunch of quizzes, like these mathematical puzzles that she can solve if she know if she's Alice and she knows the true secret. Now these methods are interactive. Uh, what we know today, boy, this slide is a little confused here. Where are we? What we know today is that we have a lot more um, facility to do non-interactive zero knowledge groups. So the original papers, uh, there was our paper that came up with the concept, showed a few examples. There is a paper by Gold, Ruff, Mikali, and Vigderson who showed that it's not just particular password type theory facts that you can prove in zero knowledge, but anything. So if you want to prove that you went through a certain computation, that a contract is binding, uh, and that you've signed, you have a signature of the contract, uh, many, many, many things of that sort. In fact, any program that you run on a computer, you can prove that you ran it, and this is the result, without actually showing the execution trace. So somebody doesn't have to rerun the computer. You can still prove to them that you've run the program on the computer, and here's the result, not revealing anything except for the fact that this program on this input gave this output. Now, that was all interactive, but um, there's in 1988, I think, or uh, yeah, 88, Blum, Mikali, and Feldman have uh, come up with this idea of non interactive zero knowledge, meaning that you can just, uh, Alice just sends Bob a string, he can read it. And at the end, be convinced that Alice knows the secret, the password, uh, or the secret proof, and um, he learns nothing else. And then later, between 2012 and 2014, this idea of a snark was uh, came up with in a work by Bitansky, Canetti, Chiesa, and uh, and Tromer in one paper, joined with the paper of myself with Lynn and Rubinstein. And the idea here was for succinct non-interactive zero knowledge group. So not only you can prove something, but proof can be much, much shorter than what you are trying to prove. So the statement you're trying to prove, which you may think of uh, is like a contract, a smart contract on a blockchain, or that a digital signature is valid. It may be even describing the contract as long, writing down the digital signature as long, but the proof is actually quite short. And it is in zero knowledge. And that is the proof that let's say a signature is valid or a contract is valid. So how do you do it non-interactively? You mean it makes kind of sounds impossible. Zero knowledge it sounds impossible anyway, but non-interactive, the framework is that there's the proving entity that was Alice. There's Bob who's checking the verifier. And um, and there's also something called a, re a common reference string. So this is some source of randomness that everybody in the world agrees on. So when you see zero knowledge in the context of blockchain, say there is some what they call a common re random string, common reference string that everybody in the blockchain has access to. And because we believe it's random and independently chosen, we will believe the ver verity of the proofs that come up and uh, the fact that there's zero knowledge. So, but short of that, non-interactive zero knowledge can be recorded for a long time. It's not interactive. It can be verified pu publicly by anybody at any time later. So zero knowledge has a lot wider applicability. Protection from identity theft goes back to 85. People talked about using it for nuclear disarmament. It's kind of an interesting project. It came out of Princeton. Uh, in the context of business in, in industry, which I think most of the people on the call are interested in, uh, I think it first came to public domain a, through the company called Zero Cash, which talked about a cryptocurrency which protects the privacy and anonymity of transactions by having a transaction and proving that it's valid um, and done by a valid user of the, of the chain without revealing contents of the transaction or the identity. Uh, these days, there's a, a lot of companies or several companies that are doing it. Uh, an outbirth of zero cash is a company called uh, ZK Stark or Starkware, um, it's located in Israel. And they are actually working with the Ethereum network to come up with verification of transactions, and they also have the capability of doing zero knowledge verification of transactions. But in today, I, I really, um, let's skip this and talk about this later. I want to switch to another domain where there's a lot of verification dilemmas, where there are things to prove, but you don't want to disclose information. And it's in a, in a legal domain. 
So in a sense, if we now switch to a legal domain, we're not just talking about technologies or fintech companies, we're talking about the legal system. And it's an interesting question to ask, how would they view this idea of a zero knowledge proof, where you sort of decouple the, the act of verification from knowledge of the facts. So I prove to you that a claim is true without actually giving you any, the password, for example, or any, by analogy, if you sort of abstract out the facts of the case, but I still prove to you the case is correct. So let me then, let me tell you about specific uh, legal settings, okay, legal dilemmas, um, where this may be useful. Question? Switching gears here. I think, I think we're good for now. Okay. So uh, the law is full of trust problems, which involves verifying uh, digital information. And I'm gonna go through four bodies, four different bodies of law where that's the case, but what's common between them, so at the outset, is it is one party, such as a potential contracting uh, or litigating uh, agent or government agency, which wants to verify some facts. And normally in the way it's done today, verification of those facts requires disclosing substantial amount of sensitive information. And furthermore, disclosure creates the risk uh, that this disclosed information can be misused, either deliberately or just because you aggregate it and then you pay no attention, somebody steals it. Uh, and how it's dealt with today, this risk of disclosure is there's a whole bunch of legal doctrines, uh, which by and large don't work in my opinion, to address these uh, verification dilemmas that you need to verify in order to convince someone uh, sorry, you need to disclose in order to someone to verify, but disclosure has risk. Um, and we say it's a dilemma when the disclosure benefit is uh, less than the disclosure risk. So there's some loss by disclosing, and that loss might be bigger than what you're gaining. Okay, so what are the, what's, if we look, think about the legal landscape, uh, there's sort of four areas of law where these kind of verification dilemmas come up. One of them is privacy law. Um, I'll dig into it in, in a few seconds. The other one is deal making while protecting innovation. So if you wanna go beyond the boundary of your own firm uh, because you wanna merge with another firm, because you wanna sell your technology, because you wanna buy a company, uh, you need to disclose, disclose information. And already back in 62, uh, Arrow showed something called the Arrow's paradox, uh, which essentially shows that in order to make money, you have to go beyond the boundary of the firm, but by going beyond the boundary of a firm, you're disclosing information, which is loss potential, and there's a paradox there. And um, so you might be having to relinquish valuable economic opportunity just because there's risk. Then there's trade secret law. So let's say you're in litigation and uh, you want to claim someone took away something from you. To verify this, you have to disclose more and more information about your technology, which you might not want to do. And then there's administrative law, sort of government oversight, accountability, and um, you know, exceptional ac access for law enforcement. So these are, uh, there's different sort of regulations, legal uh, precedents and laws that stand behind each one of these areas. So I would assume that if in fact we are gonna propose to change some of, of the ways that things are done, it will have to be scrutinized by to see if, if this idea of um, proving a claim with high probability, because there's a small probability of failure, is acceptable. Um, because what we're saying is that in all of these four areas where you have verification dilemmas, it actually points to a potential use for zero knowledge. And I'll show you how for each case. But uh, let me say in the outset that if it were the case that law would allow you zero, zero knowledge, it I think has amazing benefit. And the benefit is not just to make things um, more efficient because you're using computers rather than using uh, lawyers uh, or cheaper, but because um, it, it will allow new and, uh, and nimble, sort of more expressive, more precise legal trade-off between verification and exposure. So realize that these are different things. To verify something and to expose data are different things and we can um, 
be nimble about it. How much we, we still can verify a lot of things without disclose and we can decide how much we want to disclose and how much we don't want to disclose. And another thing is uh, this means that uh, from a governmental point of view or GDPR or privacy regulation, it means that it expands policy choices around disclosure. And uh, of course, greater accountability for those uh, powerful entities like governments who make laws or enforce them to be accountable. Um, and this would be relevant to device, device seizure, um, search and seizure, gag orders, crypto backdoors. We'll talk about all that. The challenge in all this is how do you take this theory of, of zero knowledge, interactive, non-interactive, from theory to practice? And luckily we have more and more entities, companies, which are doing that. So they really come out of um, kind of photography theory and uh, with uh, also uh, systems expertise and working at these very uh, times to, to make that. And part of this is also developing uh, homomorphic encryption and making it practical. So there will, will be challenges in all these four uh, law areas. And the main, I kind of put down what the challenges are up front, and we'll see in each uh, case that it comes about. And that is, how do you pin down what is the relevant data that are you going to prove something? Let's say, um, usually the, the way we think about it, instead of actually giving you the password or giving you the contract or giving you the trade secret, I'm going to encrypt it. And then I'm going to prove that this thing that I encrypted is has certain properties. Like it might, um, a, you, you'll see in specific cases that for trade, for, for, um, for litigation, let's say I want to say that my patent or my technology is much better than yours. Maybe I can encrypt sort of the digital uh, description of my technology and you'll encrypt yours and one can decide whether it's better or not better under encryption. Uh, or you can prove that my, I can prove that my technology has certain properties without revealing it. Uh, Shafi, we do have a question for you. Yeah. Um, what is your opinion on garbled circuits, which tries to solve the problem of verification without exposure? Okay, so garbled circuit is actually intended not for uh, proving, it's to take a computation, write it in a garbled form and be able to com compute it without actually knowing which computation you're computing. It's a beautiful technology that started with Yao. There's lots and lots of implementations of it. It can be used also in this context, but in the context of verification is, I, I uh, um, let's say I'm someone who's trying to prove something. I know everything unencrypted. I just want to convince you that what I know without giving it has certain properties. So I could encrypt it and not no garble circuits, just encrypt. And now I want to prove to you using these uh, zero knowledge methods or something that this thing that I encrypted has certain properties. So what are the properties? If it's a contract, you know, it's a contract between me and if I want to convince you that I have lots of deal, that I have a lot of people that I have contracts with, I will, and I don't want to show you who, I will prove to you that this is a contract between me and between um, um, a company that has this much equity or this much uh, money. Uh, garbage circuits is, is a technology which is relevant because sometimes I want to, uh, we'll see where that could be relevant, but it's not, but it's a, it's, it's, it's a privacy enhancing technology, beautiful one, it's been used quite a bit. If you compare it to homomorphic encryption, it has some minuses, some pluses, uh, but it's not really, a, if that was a question, it's not a verification method. It's more of a, a way to compute. Thank you. Okay. So in any case, basically back to zero knowledge, you know, um, I'm talking about verifying facts, which normally are verified by lawyers uh, or in other ways, uh, I am talking about verifying digital facts. So how do I know that if somebody encrypts some, let's say I wanna verify that the salaries of the, the pitch that are, what is, how much salary this company pays to its employees? Okay, so they say, I, I don't want to tell you how much salary I'm paying to individual employees, but I'm going to uh, encrypt the salaries of all the employees and you can sort of, um, and I prove to you that this is above a certain amount of money or below a certain amount of money or what the average salary is and without revealing what, this, what the salaries are. So I'm not going to give you all the sheets of 
of, of my payments, I'm just going to encrypt and then prove to you some properties that you want to know about it. But how, the basic question is, who says that I really encrypted the right sheets? That's like ground truth. Who says that what's encrypted is the ground truth? Um, so linking digital information to ground truth is a problem that comes up. Also, there's always a question of, in a business setting, who are the stakeholders? Who's the prover? Who's the verifier? And what type of zero knowledge? Could be interactive, non-interactive, transferable, auditable? There's many variants. So let me go into the four, four areas of law that I said that this would be useful to. Privacy law. So uh, right now, when we have IDs like driver's license or uh, a green, um, you know, a Corona um, card which shows that I've been vaccinated, on my driver's license it says my age, my address, um, as a picture of me. A, on my uh, Corona thing, it says when I got vaccinated, which vaccine I got. Was it Pfizer? Was it Moderna? Was it Johnson and Johnson? How many months were in between? Where was I? All this is irrelevant, really. What I'm trying to prove with a driver's license is that I have a valid driver's license if somebody stops me. So I'm overage. What I try to uh, prove with the coronavirus identification vaccination is that I have been vaccinated and that it's valid today. And if we, this can be also in a hierarchical setting. So I want to prove to you I have an EU passport, not necessarily that I'm a resident of a particular passport. So more generally, you could imagine that you could have self sovereign. Uh, a, you decide on selectively on which information you want to disclose. And you could disclose as little as possible that's necessary for the task. But right now we have no such capacity. We either disclose everything or we don't get into the restaurant. Um, you know, so how, how do you address that? So Estonia, which is a very, very uh, developed uh, digital and cryptographic um, setups, you know, have, um, let's say, a partially blockchain-based national identity system, a, which actually manages a lot of um, details about you, like your travel, your health benefits, your bank account access, medical record administration. And the question is, can you, do you necessarily have to have view of everything, or can you just prove properties of what's been committed on, let's say, a blockchain? Um, Deal making. Um, in uh, so, it, how zero knowledge address it here? It just you would sort of uh, encrypt, I guess, the driver's license in such a way that you could prove that it's valid, or you could encrypt the fact that you had vaccines. So you say every, every time you got a vaccine, it was signed and uh, and uh, dated, and you could prove that your thing is valid which is that you know, all the vaccines were taken. Were the last one was taken two weeks ago, um, et cetera, et cetera, but not more than, I don't know, six months ago uh, without actually revealing the other details. So I know how to do that because I did take the vaccinations and I know the entire story, but to you, I just prove what you need to know. Deal-making. So remember I talked about deal-making. So here's an example where this came up as a problem. There's this, there's this case called the Target Smart case, where a potential uh, buyer uh, received access to a lot of proprietary software and data under NDA. So we're all familiar with NDAs, but it turned out to be a front of, for a arrival who just wanted to find out about your software and data. And litigation continues at this point about this issue. Uh, and, in, and more generally, as I say, this is a, a special case of this arrows disclosure problem paradox where going out of the firm a, to a buyer you know means that you um, should only be done where the potential benefit is less than is greater than the secret loss otherwise it's not worth it and uh, the legal solution is is you know to find the right balance to trade off the harms in both places um, but uh, the zero knowledge solution would allow companies to choose which information to disclose and then prove the rest of zero knowledge. It will allow due diligence in uh, hostile environments and uh, minimizing the disclosure of secrets. Um, so um, the question of course is how again to link the proof to the ground truth. So, and then you're revealing all kinds of things under NDA, you just disclose it all. How do you uh, 
prove something in zero knowledge and how why would they believe to you that you have encrypted the digital information which is really reflects uh, what's true a so there are lots of ways to go about this it might be that if you are claiming that you have a contract with a company you have a digital signature of that company so on the contract so all you have to prove is that you have the validity of a signature you have uh, without actually naming the document that has been signed. Uh, so we call these commitments. Uh, or, you know, sometimes it's not just verifying a digital signature validity, then you would have to devise a separate sort of verification process uh, on a case by case basis. Um, Chafi, we do have another question. Mm -hmm. um, from an implementation perspective, do you think proving if I have taken a vaccine six months ago will involve a device that will compute the digital signature for that information and present present it to the authority asking for it? Yes, I think that it's, it doesn't have to compute it, it can compute it offline, right? So you got a digital signature, the authority gave it to him when you got the vaccine. So what it would involve is to prove to me uh, a, that you have, um, that the thing that has been signed a, has a, a valid date so in other words it was signed in, in september okay and i want to prove to you that the document that has been signed and is valid so that first of all the signature is valid and second of all that in that document uh, the date was uh less than you know six months than today so i think digital signatures would definitely be part of it but not sufficient and i do want to say uh, you know that the implementation issue is the biggest issue so there are easy cases like verifying numbers of customers and characteristic about them without revealing full customer list, like verifying attributes of contracts and their terms, uh, you know, like their length, uh, who are they assigned to, what are they contingent on, uh, things like dates, um, could be even um, on documents. You could run a natural language processing. Uh, I, I could run it a, on my document and because I it's my document, so I've actually run it and I want to prove to you that that I ran it in uh, like a bag of words or some other NLP um, algorithm and these are the results. It never so you know what comes up is um, the following names come up, the following terms come up. Um, so text processing. Uh, I can prove to you the results of text processing without giving you the whole document. That could be also like let's say in a malpractice case if you look at doctor's notes, you don't want to reveal all the notes. You could prove that you ran a certain uh, text processing uh, algorithm on the doctor's notes, and this is what it it uh, came up with. Great, thank you so much. Okay. A, but there is not everything simple. I mean, even the simple cases take implementation. There's more uh, complex cases where suppose you're discussing a merger and acquisition thing then uh, it's more than one party. You want to talk, I want to reveal to you, you want to reveal to me, I want to prove properties to you, you want to prove properties to me. It might be involving like a multi-party computation and, uh, and then you add as your knowledge proof on top of it. You know, So let's say we are a part of three companies and we want to prove to a fourth one something. A, so th that involves other technologies like uh, actually multi-party computation, is a, is, a, is a protocol where the stressful parties can communicate, send messages back and forth and without revealing to each other their data. A garbled circuits is another type of technology that helps that. Um, so uh, as you know, this talk is not about secure multi-body computation. One could have a much bigger talk on that, but uh, it's, it's something that even in the government, uh, there are proposals for definitions. Um, and uh, here's a, a specific definition that I've seen, and that is, um, I'm just hiding my own screen for a second, right? Uh, this is something that was proposed to con Congress saying that the secure, the term secure multi-party computation is a computerized system that enables different participating uh, entities in possession of private system data to link and aggregate their data sets uh, without transferring or otherwise revealing any private data to each other. So that's a very um, layman's definition, but it really captures what we are trying to do, and we have techniques for doing that. And what it has to do with verification dilemmas that if you have, you don't have just a single prover and one verifier, you might have several provers who are doing an M a multi-party computation within them, and then they prove the result to, to a verifier. That could be the case, for example, 
when you, um, and let's just skip ahead here, when you do, um, I skip ahead or am I going back? Hmm. Uh, in the case of uh, trade secret disputes, uh, where you have a plaintiff and a defendant, and uh, neither one really wants to disclose too much information, uh, but the plaintiff, in order to be heard in court, has to disclose their information. Uh, they could agree with each other to do a multi-party computation where they don't disclose to each other or to the judge, but they are able to run a computation and then prove to um, in court that what the outcome was. Um, I just wanted to, one of the slides that I skipped here talks about a state of the art in implementation now. Yeah, so the state of the art of implementation is we have general feasibility in theory and more efficient protocols have been developed over the years where whether it's garbage circuit or multi-party computation or fully homomorphic um, but, you know, the way that this things moves is that there's general results, and then there's papers that do particularly more efficient solutions, and, whoops, did Zoom disappear? No. Uh, and then there's uh, prototypes, and then there's product level. So for product level, I think the whole blockchain and cryptocurrency world is a fantastic example how it can go really quickly from uh, prototype to product, at least, especially in the in the Starkware, where they are doing uh, amazing number of signature verifications uh, at scale very quickly. Um, okay, let me go ahead, jump to where I was. Um, Right, so we talked about trade secrets. Um, and we talked about the fact that there could be multiple provers and only a single verifier. Uh, I, last place is administrative law. So uh, you might be able to do like um, verify uh, all kinds of reports of companies. They, they might not wanna give details. You can verify uh, let's say by a health regulator, that the underlying data used in a pharma study is not biased without revealing the patient's actual uh, health records. You can verify government claims that surveillance that they're using is uh, done in accordance to, um, to the law. Uh, so usually we use surveillance supposedly to establish uh, guilt, to get enough evidence to establish guilt, but we need to get a court order from the judge in order to do that. And indeed, uh, there, um, that's that's a very uh, interesting domain. How do you verify that everybody followed the rules? So that they, let's say FBI asks for a surveillance order from the judge, they got a surveillance order. According to the, the law, you're supposed to lift the gag order. There's a gag order on these surveillance orders within three months. It turns out that they usually don't lift these these order, secrecy orders. Nobody has time to do it, and that that's a problem. So I'll show you in a minute what a project that we've done about that. Um, Another example is in the New York City uh, office of the chief medical exam. There's a famous case where they developed forensic statistics, some software program that was designed to statistically analyze complex mixtures of DNA found in crime scenes. And they were subpoenaed to show it. And, um, and it turned out that uh, a, the program didn't work well. So if there were too many suspects that might have been involved in a crime, it would make mistakes. So the need for auditing is clear. Um, there's another example of stress test for, for financial institutions to see that they comply with regulation uh, to check whether the stress tests are, 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 are um, strong enough. I think that there was a case that was brought uh, in front of a judge where some banks claimed that the other banks were stress test um, less severely than they were. So being able to, um, so this, essentially audit these things without finding really out what the results were for specific banks. So I wanna just end with, uh, uh, let me see what time it is. I, I wanted to say that uh, in terms of the surveillance, uh, there's lots and lots of surveillance orders out every year, thousands. And uh, the chain of command is that, um, you know, 
um, of course, you don't want anybody to know that there's surveillance going on during the surveillance. So you seal the case and then you have a gag order preventing the parties involved even to mention it to others. So not just the details of the case, but even mention the case exists. But um, it has been pointed out that it's Judge Smith that they never really um, reveal or unseal you know, these uh, surveillance, which they must. Otherwise, it's very hard to, um, you know, verify that it, it, there's an, an overabundance of surveillance being done because there's never any notice of it even existing. So this is really just because the magistrate judges have really hundreds of orders, um, which have no time to um, lift the, you know, the, the, the secrecy orders, but that means that there's really no appellate guidance because nobody knows these things existed. So you can't even accurately assess the breadth of how much surveillance is done. And in fact, the only thing we know about how much surveillance is done is that companies release reports like Microsoft, you know, the Googles and so forth, um, you know, uh, of how much surveillance has been done, how many requests they got. And we believe them when they give us these reports, these are just some images of reports. So how do we check that this is all true? So this Judge Smith suggested there will be a cover page for every surveillance that's being done, which contains metadata about the case, which could always be made public. And the metadata would be uh, very little, just that the case exists in a particular state, uh, but there's an obvious tension here between accountability and privacy. How much do you reveal on this cover sheet? But if you think about zero knowledge, you can get the best of both worlds. You can get complete privacy and complete accountability. Um, and uh, we come, came up with a system uh, actually that does that like an implementation. Sorry, just to skip ahead. And the system uh, is with Danny Weitzner and uh, Jonathan Franco has now just gone to Harvard, Sanu Park and Daniel Shah who are students at the time. And the system here takes advantage of the fact that the judicial system in the United States is hierarchical. So there's like nine, there's the circuit courts here in the middle uh, and you and the judges can sort of split their surveillance order in shares. And these guys can do a multi-party computation where they can verify uh, a, the validity of the surveillance, like it should have been given. And also that it has been, gag orders have been lifted after a certain time passed. And maybe they can even uh, corroborate, you know, these uh, reports that Microsoft and Google and so forth um, are, are um, are giving the public because they can take some aggregate statistics and compare that to those reports. So I have, I think, a few more minutes and I wanted to say something about duality. Do I have time? Yes, you do. Okay, so I mentioned the homomorphic encryption. So full homomorphic encryption is essentially a special encryption scheme which allows clients to encrypt their data, upload it to the cloud, let the tell the cloud to run programs on this uh, data, and the cloud can do it without the, being able to decrypt. Then they give you the output of running the program, but it's, it's self-encrypted because they did all the computation without decrypting and send it to the client, the client can decrypt. And it's very expressive. These days you can do any computation really. Um, and uh, it's all a question of how wonderful. So there are all these beautiful papers. Do we have systems up and running? And there are a couple of libraries uh, one of them was designed by IBM, HE Lib, it's a library seal, I think by Microsoft. And there's a library called Palisades that was designed by uh, the company that I um, am a co-founder of. And Palisade is public domain, people can use it. But furthermore, really, what does the company do? It's called Duality Technology. And what it does is it enables really information sharing in, uh, in ways, uh, in private ways. So these are slides that the company's made, so they're much more beautiful than my slides. Um, and they say in, that we really address this idea that we can um, get uh, value from aggregate data uh, without suffering the, you know, the privacy, security, legal regulation, and trust challenges. And the way to do that is uh, by a combination of data science and cryptography. Um, and uh, we can, uh, essentially address a lot of issues that have come up with um, not doing trusted third parties, not anonymization, not classical encryption. All these things are not good enough. There's essentially ways to trace back 
even when you're anonymized. Uh, it's been shown time and again, uh, trusted third party, that's the whole issue. Who are we trusting exactly? Maybe the cloud can be break, broken into uh, and classical encryption just doesn't offer processing capabilities. So you can encrypt the data and send it to the cloud. But now the cloud has to work on it. So what duality offers is uh, a way to do this uh, always being powered by uh, fully homomorphic encryption. It's also quantum safe. Uh, and uh, here are some examples of, of products. Uh, so for example, you can run statistics on uh, a data sets. These could be li linked data sets. So coming from different uh, users, let's say uh, this means that the data set is e either larger or you have sort of more features for the data because different companies have different features on uh, maybe sim same set of customers. But this is a way to link those data sets without actually the companies knowing what the other company's information is and run an, you know, uh, some ML algorithm or data science type algorithm on it, like a linear regression and logistic regression. Or if you think about it, if you take the package of R, the ultimate dream is to run R on encrypted data. And we have a subset of that, of statistics that we can do very efficiently. Uh, so both for statistics or and for AI, so we can run some neural nets both in training and in uh, in um, uh, learning where you hide the queries, and in training where you hide the, the training sets and you can still train um, logistic regression, for example. And another product is queries. So uh, there could be a database that you wanted to query, but you don't want to reveal your query. Is useful for by fighting. Uh, you know, um, a money laundering in other settings where I'd like to actually find out a lot of information, but I don't want someone to see what I'm looking for because that would reveal my company's interests. And it's all based on homomorphic encryption. Um, where uh, what duality does is it gives you all the software that you need for encrypting and for decrypting, and it will run for you these, um, uh, it will, evaluate your uh, program, let's say the statistics you're interested in on your encrypted data. They don't know what you, we don't know what your keys are. Um, and other examples in the, in uh, healthcare data. So let's say that uh, there'll be lots of healthcare data coming to a center, maybe world organization, uh, but different countries have different regulations, hospitals have regulations, you want to give the data in an encrypted form so you could perform statistics on it, drive conclusions, and that you want to increase collaboration. So maybe not even just opt in, you would like to have it be out there for people to run uh, studies on a, without having to get legal agreement each time in you, a, which is takes time and sometimes people just give up. So I think we're heading there where collaborative data science can give us tremendous value, privacy enhancing technologies, whether it's zero knowledge or polymorphic encryption or garbage circuits or multi-party computation uh, will continue to improve by orders of magnitude. And my guess is it's gonna become an industry norm and uh, will be part of privacy regulations. So it's a question of time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shafi. Um, I know we do have a few questions. Um, First, I was going to unmute Pete Solovitz. I know he um, has something for you. Okay. Um, Pete, I just um, unmuted. Yeah, I, <clears throat> sorry. I, I had to click something to get it to actually unmute. Uh, thank you, Shafi. That was great. Uh, I had a question from earlier in your talk where you were talking about uh, <clears throat> the zero knowledge approaches where um, you could disclose part of the data that that somebody might want and demonstrate certain properties of the rest of the data that, uh, that you don't want to disclose to them. Um, but I was thinking about the pragmatics of this. So for example, suppose I'm an investor and I want to read the quarterly report of your company. Um, uh, and you are telling me some bottom line numbers, but let's say not the details although you can prove to me that the bottom line numbers came from the detailed numbers. Um, now, people are sneaky. <laughs> and so I could imagine that whoever put that report together 
might have hidden things in the data that I would like to know as an investor. Um, and so there's a, it seems like there's a trade-off between the privacy or security or confidentiality that you give to the publisher of the data versus the transparency that we normally seek from public disclosures, because I might be able to get some clue that you're doing something fishy from looking at those details that you're now hiding from me. And I'm just wondering if this isn't a practical impediment to people being willing to adopt this kind of technology. So great question and great point. Uh, it's, you know, if we thought about another way to think about it is let's say there's data and there's some outliers uh, and your program that you're going to run on my encrypted data is getting averages. So you're going to lose, you're not going to see the outliers. And sometimes the outliers are the most interesting thing in data. <laughs> so that's an, 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 an analogy to your yeah. detail in the report. So definitely I agree. If you need to see the data to make a decision, the full data, then this is not the right technology. But I think that there are a lot of cases where the kind of uh, scrutiny that you're going through in your reports, or, or, or I don't know if reports are the right example, but for example, uh, if it's a contract and you're, you, what you check in the contract are several very specific things and you wanna check that they hold, then it might be, if it's a template type of uh, verification, the things you wanna verify, it would be more suited. If it's something like a driver's license that you would just wanna check that the contract is valid, that it has been signed, you know? Um, another example, which is a little bit more uh, of free form is you could run, let's say an, an anomaly detection algorithm, not in the case of text, like you're looking at a document, but anomaly detection on numbers say, or on the graph that they wanna hide of, or, uh, and, and this you could run under a, um, this, let's say that's me. I, I and, and, and you tell me, I want you to write an, run an anomaly detection and show me that there are no anomalies revealed in your reports or in your data. Then I could do it. I could encrypt my data. I could even run the anomaly detection myself, not under encryption, in, in the clear, and then prove to you that the results that I got are what would have been, uh, are the correct results had I you run it on the unencrypted document that I committed to. Do you see yep. what I'm saying? Another example, which I didn't bring up, but it's something that we're working on now is, apparently there's a bunch of cases in court where let's say the FBI used some surveillance on a pornography ring or something, and they now wanna bring people to, to trial. Uh, and the defendants can say, yes, but we'd like to see your surveillance software. And it's been happened more than once, several times where the government says, well, then I guess we drop the case. Uh, because they don't want to reveal this surveillance software. Not because they necessarily did something wrong, but because they want to use it again. So you could imagine them encrypting the surveillance software, but there's still things that they have to prove to the defense, like that they didn't plan trap doors when they ran on your porn site, that they didn't uh, make any calls. So there's, if you could write down the kind of things you're checking, they could run it themselves, the government, and then prove to you that the result of running the follow the checks that you specified is X, whatever it is. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Awesome. Um, Shafi, we do have um, a few more questions if you have a- Yeah, yeah I see that uh, about wills. Can this be used for wills? Oh, for sure. <laughs> wills are an interesting case. Um, I don't know what you had in mind, but I can imagine this is, Raja ben um, but say you want to prove some properties of the wills, but you don't want to disclose everything, like who else got money and so forth. Um, yes. So if there's something specific that you are promising happens in a will, and you have a way code that you can write down how you would verify this by a computer, you can certainly run the code. Uh, I have the will, I run the code that's supposed to verify certain things about this will, and then I prove to you that it's, it's, ver it's verified without showing you the will. And another, is there a dilemma? The privacy or NDA also protects the violation of NDA disclosure of third party privacy. The privacy. Uh, 
I'm not sure I understood. Maybe they can say it out loud. Something about the question I don't understand. This is uh, Wei Hong Jing. Can you explain the question? Yeah, I can ask to unmute. Yeah, this is Wei Hong. So my question is, you know, between different parties, company, the NDA disclosure of the data is kind of tricky because some of the data, uh, let's say I sign an NDA for the company A, which some data give to me. Now this data, which I already discovered before, right? Which I already, already knew that one. Then this kind of data overlap, or use the metadata data A, A plus, we overlap with the A's data, right? So that this disclosure is part of the data to the other companies like C. Is that violation? Or it's, uh, you see what I mean? It's kind of tricky thing. So that's, a legal, so that's a legal question, right? So in the NDAs, usually they write that uh, anything new you discover, you're not supposed to reveal. But if you knew it before, and how do you check that? Did you know it before? Didn't you know it before? So that's an interesting, uh, it's always a murky, a murky situation. It's a legal question that doesn't have to do with zero knowledge. If anything, we could help it possibly. Um, but, but it's correlated, right? Because zero knowledge, which means before I know the company a data gave to me, I don't know, I already know that, right? So it's, it's I have to, NDAs gives me some data, which I already knew part of it that, but I legally all. I see what you're saying. So you're saying yeah. that an NDA has some, uh, this, this part of an NDA agreement promises something which I cannot deliver with the zero knowledge because it says that I am protected legally uh, Correct. if I knew something before. And I can't tell if I knew it before, but once I see it, I, I, I realize that I knew it before, right? Correct, correct. Um, that's interesting. Uh, yeah, zero knowledge doesn't, uh, doesn't address that because it's something that we cannot specify in advance, right? But uh, you can imagine that if everything was digital, right, all the documents and data that I know has been committed to, let's say on a blockchain or in some way uh, encrypted all my files, and now I get to see yours, then in fact, technology helps here because you could prove to me that you knew it, but if you don't have the, the records, then I, I don't believe you. So even today, there's a problem, right? I claim I knew it before, but maybe I didn't. So it would be great to be able to prove that I knew it before, so not to put myself at risk. Correct. So the thing yeah. is, uh, different company, different parties have the information exchange. Sometimes really cannot claim it's 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 NDA. I mean, all the, you know. Anyway, so it's it's that's just something I want to cover by their knowledge or not. Anyway. Uh, no, no, their knowledge really is that there's a there's a fact that you are checking, okay, and uh, unless you could define a correlation between a the, your data and the data you're going to see, right? And, and claim and, and commit to everything you know, which is hard, but let's say you complete it to your data, compete to your data, and then you say, if there's gonna be correlation between my data and yours, so your data is worthless to me because I knew it already, okay? Then I'm not bound by our secrecy law. That's something, if you could quantify that, then uh, zero knowledge would be useful because you could sort of essentially, um, it would be a two-party protocol between me and you under the covers, you know, where we check the correlation of our data. And in case there is correlation, then we don't, uh, then I guess we don't even need zero knowledge. We just don't go into the, we don't, uh, we take that as part, that's not part of the knowledge that I am willing to to look at. Yeah, it's tricky. Of course, you non course of things, it's really tricky. Anyway, it's very, so tricky. It's, it's very tricky. It's great, great point, great point, very tricky. In fact, that part of, of NDAs is tricky anyway, isn't it? Uh, and in fact, that's, I think, where you get most of the problem because people can always claim they knew it earlier. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Sorry, this is a very satisfying answer, but a very interesting question. Um, Safi, I know we're running um, a little bit over. I do have one more question if you have time. Okay. Uh, uh, so finally, um, how does homomorphic encryption compare to other computation schemes example, the garbled circuit that was briefly talked about earlier, why would you use this for collaborative diamond? Great, great question. 
So uh, one can has to sit down and go through it, but uh, homomorphic encryption, uh, the, the big thing is that it's, uh, it's uh, not, there's no communication necessary. So you encrypt everything in advance, you put it away, and now you could do lots of computations on it. With garbled circuits, for every computation, you have to prepare a new, uh, a new garbling of the circuit and have to encrypt your data in such a way that you can enter it into the uh, garbled circuit. So in other words, it's a pair computation, and uh, that's one issue with it. I want to compute on, on gar uh, using garbled data. I have to encrypt my data. I have to garble my circuit in a compatible way. Then I run it. Whereas with homomorphic encryption, you encrypt once, then you compute later. It's one thing. The second thing is garbled circuit is uh, based on a Boolean technology. Everything is represented as Boolean circuits. The, uh, the homomorphic encryption is using a sort of arithmetic of larger numbers. So you can um, essentially do it um, sometimes in a way that's native to the application rather than having to translate to, to a Boolean case. A, and the third is really uh, the traditionally uh, garbled circuit and the way they use it in multi-party computation requires a lot of interaction where homomorphic encryption, the whole point is I send it, now you do all the computation, then you send it back. That's the only kind of interaction. Great. Well, thank you so much, Shafi, for uh, presenting today. And I want to let everyone know if you're watching this presentation um, after the fact, to please let us know if you have any more questions. We're happy to connect you uh, with Shafi. So Shafi, thank you again. Thank you everyone for attending today. This was really um, insightful uh, presentation. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye everyone.